Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us every other week for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. We're so glad you could join us today. Today we have an exciting episode planned for you as we look at the topic of prospective trials as they relate to AI augmented ECG algorithms for clinical practice. We'll be joined by someone we know very well here at the Mayo Clinic and has some of the earliest experience with this rather new clinical application tool. And so let's get started. Now, over recent years, numerous AI augmented ECG algorithms have made their way to the medical literature, and some even earning FDA approval. Here at Mayo Clinic, we have seen nearly a dozen of various models using the ECG to assess ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, aortic stenosis, and comprehensive ECG interpretation, just to name a few. The clinical potential we envision for our patients with these models is exciting. But do they hold up in clinical practice? and where and how do we appropriately apply them. Today we will discuss how to go about evaluating these AI augmented ECG algorithms for clinical practice, current experience in this new arena, including areas of caution, how to best accomplish this, and examples of prospective studies. We will cover all of this with not only someone that has thought through these questions, but has also experienced and successfully navigated them firsthand. Without further delay, please let me introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Peter Noseworthy. Dr. Noseworthy is a professor of medicine and a cardiac electrophysiologist. He serves as the director of Mayo Clinic's Heart Rhythm and Physiologic Monitoring Laboratory, where he leads a multidisciplinary team working to develop novel ECG software-based analysis tools. Dr. Noseworthy, thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to discuss what we have in store. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, you know, what I thought we could start with, and I've not only seen and seen firsthand what you've been able to accomplish with all these algorithms, but the big question that a lot of people have as we read through them is, when can we apply them? How do we apply them? And so what does, what are the next steps to actually get to clinical practice for our patients? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So it's one thing to derive an algorithm and show that it works in some retrospective data set. It's quite another to actually bring it live to the point of care and make it useful for clinicians. And you can imagine a world where we develop all sorts of algorithms that sort of languish in between and never make it to practice, or they come to practice and they end up gumming up the machinery of the way we work. And that's not the intended purpose here. The purpose is to try to improve the care for our patients and also to streamline medical care. So at Mayo Clinic, we've actually been very aggressive in terms of trying to roll these things out to the, to the practice. And we've actually created, uh, not myself, but the greater we as our team, to make a, uh, essentially a dashboard that allows clinicians to look at the results in real time and also look at them in the context of all the other ECGs that they've had run. So it's embedded in our electronic health record. If they open up a patient record, they can click on something called AI dashboard, and it'll in real time run all of our models. And right now there's eight or 10 models on the dashboard. And then it will display them graphically as well as in a, in a, tabula, a tabular form, all the results. And a clinician can look at that and interpret it as a, as a whole. And a lot of clinicians have adopted this uh, enthusiastically. And it's been, I think, an uh, area of great practice improvement and innovation at Mayo Clinic, it's something that I'm very proud to be a part of. Yeah, and and so you're saying that through a patient, say coming in or even in your clinic that you see, you run an ECG before they come to see you in the office, you can see all these predictions from the algorithms immediately? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it'll actually run on any ECG that had ever been ordered. So if I see a patient who's been at Mayo Clinic for years, I may see, you know, a couple dozen ECGs going back 30 years, back to about 1990. And you can see how these things trend over time and uh, sort of get a clinical gestalt about what the AI is thinking about what's happening on, at the level of the ECG. And so almost potentially using it for clinical application and practice, right. uh, what you're thinking. What's the use? Have people been using it and adopting to it? What's yeah, the- no, I mean, of course, we have to be very careful because we, uh, we make these available as tools, sort of almost like we're all beta testers to get a sense of how AI can be applied at the point of care. And we like to elicit feedback from the practice to understand what's working and what's not. Where does it seem to help? Where does it seem to hinder practice? And it's really meant to be an investigational tool right now, but we are making it readily available to all Mayo Clinic uh, doctors. 
So uh, we've seen some you know, early adopters who embrace it enthusiastically and have found niche applications within their practice, maybe cryptogenic stroke or AFib risk prediction, or within the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic and things like that. And others look at it more uh, uh, as, a, as a curiosity or out of interest. But it probably gets several thousand uh, I engagements per month uh, so it's being used a lot by uh, clinicians at Mayo Clinic already. And is it only here at Mayo or where? where Across is the Mayo Clinic going? enterprise. So all of our, uh, anybody who has a Mayo Clinic Epic login essentially to our overall okay. uh, database uh, can, can look at it. Now, uh, we're trying to learn about how this can be worked, how it can be validated, where it works, where it doesn't, where the guardrails might be. And eventually, we'd, kind of, we'd like to make these technologies available more broadly, even outside of Mayo Clinic. But that's, uh, that's our uh, long-term ambition. Yeah, no, and I, I think the next thing is you have these different users, and some of them you know, loving it and adopting early, others being loving kind of the investigational component and not sure how to use it. And that's kind of where that clinical application comes in. Um, right. Well, one of our one one way we look at it is we like to develop these models, but then we don't want to keep them for ourselves. So if we get them out into the practice, then anybody who has a research question related to these can validate it in a given population or try it for an adjacent sort of indication to what it was intended for. And that's extremely useful because we see where it works well and where it doesn't. And there have been examples where it, it's a home run, and there's been examples where it's fallen you know, flat on its face. So we have to be aware of those sorts of so things. So let's talk about both of those examples. Yeah. Maybe start with the ones where they've fallen flat. Yeah. Is there? Um, well, for instance, uh, atrial fibrillation risk. We have a very good model that performs quite well for identifying concomitant but potentially undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. And we just completed a, a prospective study evaluating it. And it does look like it works very well. But you would think for a common thing like post-operative atrial fibrillation that that model might be a good predictor for that outcome. So we've tested it actually in a couple cohorts for cardiac and non-cardiac surgery, and it really doesn't work very well at all. And that's a good example where something that intuitively may seem to be relatively straightforward application of the AI has not worked well. So we published that experience just to let people know that we don't have any illusions that these things are magic. They're tools like anything else we have to wield them uh, with discretion and uh, a clear uh, a database and clear mind. And so knowing that one maybe didn't perform as maybe hoped for, but how is the best way we evaluate or measure their success? Yeah. Well, like I said at the beginning, it's one thing to derive these on retrospective data sets that can look great, but we really have to hold them to the same level of rigor and accountability to all diagnostic and therapeutic interventions that we that we introduce into our practice. So I think we really need to evaluate these things in prospective trials and ideally randomized uh, prospective trials. And we're just starting to do some of that with these algorithms at Mayo Clinic. And I, you know, I've heard of some of, you know, the, the Eagle and the, the Beagle and some of these studies that you've, you know, pioneered in this space, maybe share a little bit of kind of what that study design looks like in, in Right, because these are new. We haven't really seen any clinical trials, uh, and even prospective assessing this. So, right. could you share a little bit about some of those trials? Let me tell you a little bit about the Eagle trial. Yeah, that's one that's now available in the uh, medical literature, and that your listeners and viewers can review it. Um, before we had the dashboard, we wanted to make this available to clinicians, but we wanted to make sure that it was actually useful because we didn't want people ordering unnecessary echocardiograms, running up hospital costs, clogging up the lab. It just it, it could have been could have been a disaster if it didn't work well. So we wanted to test it prospectively. And so, if I may interrupt, what does this? What is the Eagle assessing? What so, is the, the sorry, the Eagle study was evaluating the low ejection fraction algorithm okay. in routine clinical care, mostly in primary care practices. So across the upper Midwest. Uh, primary care is delivered in care teams for the most part in over around 150 clinics in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, there are care teams delivering care to groups of patients. So we use the electronic health record to turn on this uh, dashboard, basically, or the alert uh, for uh, patients by care team in a, in a cluster randomized fashion. So some of the care teams had access to the AI where other teams did not. If they had access to the AI and we had flagged a patient who had an ECG done for any reason uh, that looked like it might indicate a low ejection fraction, but we couldn't find anywhere in the chart that they already had known low ejection fraction, we sent an alert to those primary care doctors and said, you may want to look for low EF, especially if there are symptoms or if you have some clinical suspicion. And we left it to their discretion about whether or not they wanted to order an echocardiogram. 
And what we saw was that there was about a 30% increase in the diagnosis of previously unrecognized low ejection fraction by making that algorithm available in primary care. And that was, of course, statistically significant. It would translate to many patients if you rolled it out over a large practice like Mayo Clinic, and I think could make a material impact in uh, patients' care and in, ultimately in their lives, we would think. And so what was the, the feedback you got from some of these providers that were using the tool and making decisions on it? Were, yeah. were there still issues with the early adopters? Or what no, was this, these were early days. So we yeah. heard if, if there was an opinion, we heard it. We actually went out into the field. Our qualitative researchers uh, drove to each of these sites and talked to people about what their experience was like. Um, and like you might expect, some people absolutely embraced it. Uh, other people felt like it was somehow disrupting their workflow or coming between them and the patient in a way. Um, you can imagine if you get an AI result that you yourself can't interpret, it's sometimes hard to communicate that to a patient, and it almost takes you out of the equation in some way. So we heard all, all sort of uh, aspects of that. But I think the way to frame it as a clinician is you see this as a tool. Don't think of it as replacing clinical in intuition. It should probably try to augment your abilities to detect these things that are probably slipping through the cracks. And I think with that mindset, we can see these things as useful, and uh, we don't respond to them in a... In a knee-jerk type way, but we actually take that information, integrate it with what we know, and uh, give the best and most holistic care that we're available to do. Do you envision that all of kind of the algorithms follow this uh, kind of assessment, or what is... I think we probably do need to do... Now, there may be... We may take a, a model and apply it to one population and tweak it a little bit. It probably doesn't necessarily require uh, a prospective study. But I think for things that we anticipate rolling out making a material impact in the way we practice medicine, the diagnostic tests, or things that have significance to a patient's life, we really need to be rigorous about how we evaluate them. And you know, one part of it is, is doing it prospectively. The other is also to make sure that these are not unique to Mayo Clinic. It could be that they work well in our data set for our population and the racial and ethnic groups of the patients that we tend to see in our practice, and they could fail in other applications. So we have to look outside of Mayo Clinic without a doubt and develop relationships around the country and around the world for that matter to make sure that these things hold up in other uh, clinical settings. Uh -huh. and, and any final words, because I, I know we're coming close on time, any final things that you want to share of where are the fields going, what exciting stuff you have in store for us? That well, we just wrapped up our, our second prospective study. We're just now analyzing the data, um, but I'm excited about those results and excited about communicating them in the coming months. Uh, I think We've been at it for a couple of years, and there are other groups around the country doing this as well, but we're really seeing a renaissance in ECG, and I think uh, the best is yet to come. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. While many AI augmented ECG algorithms attempt to address important clinical questions, a major hurdle remains in their assessment in true clinical setting. By continuing to develop prospective trials evaluating these algorithms, we might not only learn about the best methodology to carry out such studies, but also move a step closer to understanding where and how their clinical value can be best applied in patient care. Dr. Noz, really, what incredible work. I'm so excited to be on the ground with you, seeing how you're pioneering this field. Uh, I can't wait to see what's uh, coming. And on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to a Mayo Clinic cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in every other week to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.